Here we go. Okay, the second announcement is uh, I am told, and I'm going to go double check right now in an email, that student evaluations of teaching are up and running right now. Here is my email. I'm doing it behind the scenes. So I'm reminding students about the student evaluation of teaching for spring 2021 going on right now. It actually started ah seven days ago, but no worries, you have until April 30th to get online. I don't even know where you guys find this. I'm told you find it in Blackboard, but nobody gives me any specifics beyond that. So I'm told you all find student evaluations of teaching up on Blackboard. If somebody is so brave enough to share their screen, we don't want to see your password or anything, but if you're already logged into your Blackboard account or your portal, um, I'd love you to share your screen and show everybody else where they can find um, the student evaluations of teaching. We had a volunteer in the chat, so I stopped sharing my screen and I'll let them take over. So you go to your student email and it will be in like a Chico assessment and there'll be a bunch of links. And, oh, sorry, I completed this one. So there's this one I haven't completed for you and it'll ask you to complete it. And then when you finish completing it at the bottom, you'll hit next, finish, finish, finish. There'll be a bunch of links to the rest of your classes that you can just do. Um, so like after I would finish this, I'd hit here, I finished this part, then there would be, it would take you to like all your classes and then you can do them all. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Jake. I appreciate that. Um, hopefully everybody gets an email about that. Um, Jake, let me ask you a follow up question on that. If you get that email, but you're not already logged into your portal, do you then have to log in with your like super secret credentials based on that link from within the email? Uh, well, I don't think so. I'm not logged in. I'm just You're logged not. into my, I'm just logged into my school email and it like auto does it for me. I don't have to do anything else. Okay. That's great. Thanks. I'm going to take uh, Hayes. I'll get to you in a second, but I'm going to take this opportunity to give you all a public service announcement about bad email protocol on this campus. If you ever get a link in an email that then asks you to enter your username and password, you should be very cautious with um, logging in following a link contained in an email. I think a better strategy would be don't click the link in an email yet. Go log on to the website that you know is safe and secure and gets you access to campus stuff based on your student email, and then go back and click on the link. And as long as that link leads you through all the stuff you are already logged into, it should be a safe link. But links sent in emails are a dangerous game. Um, okay, Hayes said he would post a picture on Discord of where you can find the links to your student evaluations of teaching in your Blackboard shell, uh, Hayes please and thank you. That's great. Uh, we also got a direct message. Give me a second to read it. All. Okay, great. And then um, I got a direct message indicating to me, and I will say it all to you all. I appreciate it. Um, that where you access the grades on Blackboard, there's an option at the bottom that says student evaluations of teaching, or maybe it just says student eval of teaching, something along the lines of student evaluation of teaching. In case you lost the email, you should be able to find it there. Okay, good. I appreciate you all helping me make this announcement. Uh, I don't ask that you all give me good reviews. I ask that you give me honest and respectful reviews. Uh, I'm happy to receive constructive criticism about whatever it is about this course that you don't like. There's plenty of things I don't like about this course. Um, online is hard. I am not experienced at it. We're just trying it out because we're forced to. 
Um, all I ask is that you be polite and respectful, but of course you don't have to say good things. You can say negative things, just try not to direct them at me. You would say something like, the course could have been better if yada, 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 instead of saying, Edward, you suck sort of thing. I hope you guys see the difference. Uh, basically, if you just avoid the word you, then it will be polite and respectful. Um, that's my only real comment on student evaluations. Uh, please do fill them out when you have time. I appreciate getting everyone's feedback. Um, okay, those were my announcements. Are there any announcements from anybody else before we get started? They don't have to be announcements, they could be questions. They are all anonymous student evaluations, but my concern is that when people hear the word anonymous online, they often then feel that they can say whatever they want with impunity. And I would appreciate if you did not feel that anon anonymity gives you the right to say whatever you want. Even if you're online and anonymous, you should still be polite and respectful. <laughs> please and thank you. Any other announcements or questions before we get going? Okay, then we're gonna get started and I just remembered that I want to show you all where you can find excellent resources about the topics we're going to cover this week. So if you go to our course website and click on syllabus, and then you scroll down to the two books for this class. So if we start with the first one, From this first book found in our syllabus, if you go to chapter one, and then I'll zoom in for you all. If you go to section five, we will be looking at conditional probability, and that's gonna be the topic of the week. So that's from the first textbook. That would be chapter one, section five. Alternatively, if you go to the second textbook, and I'll zoom in for us again, we'll go to probability spaces. So also chapter one, and then section four, again, named conditional probability. It's so nice when all the sections are named exactly as I want them to be named. This material uh, is covered to varying degrees of mathematical proficiency in these two different texts. This text is much more difficult mathematically, but down towards the bottom in the examples and applications section, look, I don't know if you all can see the cursor on this webpage, but I'm maybe like a third of the way down on this webpage. And from here down are problems and practice problems and examples that are of varying degrees of difficulty, but all of them are excellent. Um, I really like this book specifically for the practice problems it gives. That's not to say the other book doesn't have practice problems that will help you through this material, but these ones I find to be particularly um, wide ranging in difficulty, which I think is helpful for learning. Okay, so here it is. We're gonna start with a recap and motivation. Imagine flipping three fair coins. Well, then we'd have a sample space that looks like, and we can just 
write all of these out fairly quickly. We have a sample space that looks like heads, heads, tails, heads, 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 tails, heads, whoops. Struggling to um, write and talk at the same time. Tails, heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails, tails. Okay, did I miss any? Yes, uh-oh, which one did I miss? Uh, tails, heads, tails, apparently. So if we were gonna flip three fair coins and call it like one experiment, then our sample space might look like this. And for any little s in capital S, we'd have the probability of s is equal to 1 8th by independence. So here's our recap. Recall if events are independent, then you can multiply the individual probabilities. So in this case, if we have a fair coin, how did I come up with the probability of 1 8th for any of these outcomes? For any one of these outcomes, for flipping a fair coin three times, how did I come up with 1 8th? Okay, let's try breaking down the problem, see if we can work our way to an answer. What is the probability of observing heads on a fair coin? One half, thank you, Nathaniel. So in this case, for each heads on this first outcome, we have probability of one half for the first head, probability of one half for the second head, and probability of one half for the third. What happens if I multiply together those three one-halves? OK, it looks like uh, I froze for a little bit, and then I stopped talking because I was waiting for a question. So that might have confused us all. But hopefully we are back now and you all are better seeing where this one eighth came from. Because indeed, if you have a fair coin and you flip it three times, the probability of heads is one half. Since these three coins have nothing to do with each other, this is one half times one half times one half. And in fact, since it's a fair coin, the probability of tails is also one half. So it doesn't matter how many tails or heads I have here, as long as the coins are independent, I can multiply together their probabilities. Okay, so that was theoretically a recap of independence that we've seen before. Is everyone okay with that? Yep. Yes. Great, thank you all. So, what we're going to do then is try extending this to a world where we imagine we get information about the sequence of flips in chunks. We're going to extend this example to a world where we imagine we obtain 
information about the sequence of flips in chunks. So we don't receive all the information at once, but we receive partial information as we go. Okay. So what if you learn that exactly two of the three coins show heads. Wait, that's not a question. Then what is the probability of the first coin being heads? That's my question. So I want us to think of this as partial information coming in, in like um, discrete pieces, I'm calling them chunks. So what if you learn that exactly two of the three coins show heads? Then based on that information, what is the probability of the first head, of the first coin being heads? So we might have a mathematical statement that says like, what's the probability first coin is heads? I'll write it out the same as I have it above. Well, that actually looks like the probability of well, consider all the sequences of coins where the first one is heads. Are we not worried about duplicates, Professor, in the sequence of all the uh, combinations? What do you mean duplicates by that? So I, like, in my mind, there's heads, heads. Yeah, that like head, heads, easier. tails, and tails, heads, heads could be considered the same thing flipped. Oh, right. We will consider those as different sequences. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Wait, can the fourth one exist since there's always two heads? Ah, but give me just a second. What I'm writing out is um, all the different sequences where the first coin is heads. Okay. Okay. Um, Jake, by your same logic, this one also wouldn't exist. This very first one, because we asked for exactly two heads. So what we're trying to get at here is, look, some of these have the first condition. They have the condition that the first um, flip is heads. Do we all agree with that? But some of these do not fit the piece I'm claiming to have learned. Exactly two heads. So what we'd get out here is one half. Is this okay? I'll assume so. Okay. So if we learned that extra bit, then we could say something like, what's the probability First coin is heads given two coins heads.
Okay. Here's where the extra notation gets a little different than we had before. This pipe here is to be read as given or conditioned on. So we are now reading this probability statement as what's the probability that we get the first, head, first coin of heads given that two coins are heads. So what I'm trying to do is break that question from the last slide down into mathematical symbols. We started out with just asking what's basically just the first coin of heads. But then we're now taking that information into account. Given that two of the coins are heads, given, that's this pipe, given that two of the coins are heads, what's the probability the first coin is heads? So if we come back and look at our sequence of heads, 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 tails, heads, tails, heads, and heads, tails, tails. Then, oh wait, that's, yeah. Then some of these work and some of these don't, correct? Jake pointed out that these don't qualify as given two coins were heads. Well, there's theoretically also the event tails, heads, heads. So given that these are the three events that qualify as two coins are heads, then we know there's three possible outcomes that lead with two coins are heads. However, only two of them meet this part. Okay. I think my motivation went a little sour because I think you all see the idea a little bit sooner than I was planning in my delivery, which is great. But I think that has left us um, with a jumbled motivation. So I'm gonna try one more thing off the cuff, which sometimes goes well and sometimes doesn't. We're gonna just start. the notation again. So we want to know what's the probability that the first coin is heads given that two coins are heads. Well, given two coins are heads, then the options are heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, and tails, heads, heads. Oops. Given two coins are heads, then we have these three options, correct? That's just for the condition part. Heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, heads. Hey, 
if we do three repetitions of this, could we just multiply the result by three? Or if we did four by four arbitrarily? Let me finish this out, Christian, and then I'll okay. try to answer your question. Awesome, sorry. That's okay. So this condition part is the part that I'm suggesting we are gonna learn in like a chunk of information. Some, but not all, that is partial information is going to be given to us. So we have updated our information from the previous sets that I was drawing out to this set. Now we have learned this bit. Two coins are heads. So these are the three options. Given this bit, this amount of information, what is the probability that the first coin is heads? Well, there's only one possible I mean, there's only two possible options that have the first coin being heads given the information we're conditioning on. So in this case, it's just going to be two because there's two that satisfy the first condition out of the three that satisfy the second condition. There are two events of the thing of interest. Given the information we had, well, that given part is specifying three possible events. So there's three possible events, two of which are of interest. Given that two coins are heads, there's three possible events and two of those are of interest to us. Okay, Christian, your question was if we moved this up to four coins or were you considering like actually flipping a coin? I'm, I'm saying if we did the same um, selection of the uh, probability for these, uh, for this to happen, uh, mm -hmm. any number of times, would it just be n times the probability of doing it one time? No, I don't think so. Okay. Do you want to try it out with four? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, let's try. Okay. We're going to try a new question. What's the probability of the first coin is heads given? Wait, let's set the stage a little bit. Flip four coins. Then we want to know what's the probability the first coin is head given. And now, um, Christian, how many coins were you considering? Uh, so in the last one, we want to know the first coin was head given that two of the three were heads. How many do you want to be heads in this given section? I guess I'm asking more generally if probabilities can be multiplied. Can we say that if oh. we do this, if we do the same three coins one time and we find the probability that one out of the three is different, can we then say that if we do, it's going to be the same every single time we do it, right? So can we then multiply? Yeah, the probability, I, I agree with Hayes that the probability would be the same. So, so every time we do it, it's the same probability. So if we did it n number of times, I guess that wouldn't really okay. add anything to the analysis, but. Okay, and I think what you're doing is reading into the point that I was exactly trying to break based on um, independence. Okay. So I think your question is, if I just flip n coins, isn't the probability just n fair coins, isn't the probability of any of those events just going to be one half to the power of n? Yeah, that makes sense. If the coins are independent, that works out. Okay. Okay. So what you're doing is asking the question around independence. If the coins are independent, then you could basically just flip n coins. 
you could replace this three with n, and you could replace this one eighth with one over two to the n. But what we're starting into now is a little bit different than questions about the sequence by itself. Now what we're starting to do is ask questions about this like kind of intermediate state where you have learned some information about the sequences you are interested in, but not all the information. So now we're trying to understand um, probabilities about these partial states where you have learned some information, but not complete information. So we are working towards, oh, whoops, sorry. Partial states that are written out like this. We ask the probability of some set given there is some information that pertains to the set of interest. We are asking what's the probability of some set of interest given some information about that set. So these are not direct questions about the entire sequence. These are questions about subsets of the sample space. So we're conditioning on information that is in some sense reducing the sample space. In this case, we've reduced the sample space down to three events of interest based on this partial information. Okay. Jake, yes, there is a shortcut, so to speak, and that is the definition of conditional probability. We would write out the probability of A given B for two sets A and B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. So the way I always remember this definition is whatever is being conditioned on goes in the denominator. Whatever is being conditioned on goes in the denominator. And it's the intersection in the numerator. So Jake, the shortcut is just this formula. Now I tried to give us some motivation to this formula, but I fear I did a poor job but that's okay, we have some references, some really good references in this case that should help out. So what we had earlier was a question that essentially calculated these two probabilities, but we kind of did it in our heads. We kind of did it by just counting some new sample space, which consists of the set of just sequences with two heads. I'm, yeah, just the set of sequences with two heads. And there turned out to be three of those. So we did the conditional part by looking at just the sets that satisfied like conditioned on B the set B. And then we said, based on just the stuff in B, how many of those pertain to our first set? 
A. So okay. it's the size of the size of set B in this case uh, is three. Not even though it says two coins or heads, it's we're looking at the the fact that the set has three elements in it is the size of B, correct? Oh, it's going to maintain probability. But let me show you what happens with um, these probabilities to make it seem like we're just interested in sizes. Okay, so if we think back to that set we were looking at earlier, which goes heads, heads, tails, because there's two heads there, or heads, tails, heads, two heads there, or tails, heads, heads, two heads there. Then we're essentially just looking at these probabilities. And Christian, they are probabilities. There's just gonna be some canceling that goes on to make it look like we're just interested in the sizes. So starting with the bottom, the probability that two coins are heads. Well, here are the three outcomes from the original sample space that had eight outcomes. The three that fit the conditional information. Here are the three out of the eight from the original sample space that fit the conditional information. So really, Christian, it's three eights in the denominator. Okay. And in the numerator, we're actually looking at, well, this one and this one satisfy the like set A component, but this last one doesn't. So it's only two out of three. Oh, sorry. Two out of eight. In order to get the first coin heads and two coins heads, that's really only this one and this one. That's two out of the eight original in the sample space. So can we think of the HHT, the, the sequence that you have, or the series that you have, uh, sequence at the top there, HHT, HTH, and THH, as a subset of the total eight sample space, then? That's exactly what it is. It is the right. subset that fits okay. the conditional information. Awesome. And then the two out of eight would be the subset containing only the first coin heads out of the two coins heads. Yeah. But what you're doing there is first narrow, you're essentially looking at this intersection. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of looking at this intersection in a way that fits you better. And that's perfect because you get okay. to the right idea. But what you're doing is finding the ones that satisfy two coins and intersect then the ones that also satisfy first coin heads. Do you see how you're doing that? Christian, you said, can we think of this as a subset? And of course you can, it is. And you said it's first two coins that are heads for every one of these three. And then further, you're also interested in the ones that are specifically only the first coin heads. So you actually did this intersection just kind of magically in your head. Okay, so there are some questions in the chat that point out really good things like, is B always going to be bigger than A? 
And yes, but the way we write it is that probability of B is greater than zero. Because mathematically, the only thing we need is for the denominator to be bigger than zero. And as long as the denominator is bigger than zero, then by properties of intersection, A intersect B cannot ever be bigger than B. So I like the questions in the chat, is B always going to be bigger than A? And that's getting towards the right idea. But I think mathematically, what we need to define is that the probability of B has to be positive. It cannot be zero, simply because you can't have zero in a denominator. And then based on properties of intersection, A intersect B has to be a subset of B. And that's going to satisfy the other part of the questions in the chat. So you will always get a number less, uh, equal to one or less. You will always get a number less than or equal to one because A intersect B has to be at least as, as at most as big as B. Even if you have A that looks like this and B that looks like this. Wait, no, the way you guys need to see it based on the questions in the chat is like this. I think once you stare at that picture long enough, you'll see that this fraction can at most be one because A intersect B is going to have to be a subset of B. Okay. I have provided for us two examples, which unfortunately, good. I'm glad the picture helped. <laughs> I feel like this has been one of my worst lectures yet. <laughs> and I got a picture that worked, yay. <laughs> okay, I've gotten two examples for us. I probably only have time for one of them. So we'll just start in on them and whatever I don't finish, I will, put up as a new video for us. So conditional probability is obviously not relegated to only um, flips of coins. It turns out to be an incredibly popular tool, not because people like it, but because people need it. So for instance, all of the testing that has been done surrounding COVID is basically questions of conditional probability. I don't have any actual data on COVID myself. So instead of making things up and freaking people out, I have chosen a problem based around um, cigarette smoking. But conditional probability actually extends much further to this. So the examples that we're not gonna have time for today, but I will put up in videos, try to show us a breadth of the popularity, but not by uh, how much people like it, of conditional probability. It turns out our entire legal system is also based on conditional probability, just to give you two quick examples. So the questions that it often answers are styled like this in textbooks. In a certain population, 30% of the persons in that population smoke cigarettes. 8% have lung disease, and 12% of the persons who smoke have lung disease. Now, the tough part is figuring out what that 12% actually represents so that you can answer questions that people are interested in knowing about. So I think it'll help us if we just write down this 30% is based on people who smoke. 
So let's just call that S. This 8% is based on people who have lung disease. I'm just gonna call that LD. And this last one is a bit different. 12% of the persons who smoke, so that's our partial information. We know that they smoke already, given that they smoke, conditioned on the information that they smoke already. What's the probability they have lung disease? We would write that out like this. And I think that is absolutely the hardest part of these problems is reading the question and understanding what a sentence like this tells us. And the translation into symbols goes like this. The probability that they have lung disease given that we know they smoke is 12%. So question A is actually just a question about them smoking and having lung disease. So in this case, we can just use our definition, which normally has this intersection in the numerator, and we can just modify it a little bit. It might take you a minute to see that, but please do just go consider the definition again. And it's not a very difficult, um, just multiply. It's not a very difficult operation. Just multiply the probability of a smoker up onto both sides. So we get 0.3 times 0.12. Is that 0.036? Okay, in the name of time, let's just keep moving on. What percentage of the population who has lung disease, so that's given that they have lung disease, what percentage are smokers? Okay, that's not so bad. Given that they have lung disease, we wanna know which percentage are smokers. We just found the intersection in the first problem in part A, and we would divide this by 0 0.08. Well, I can't do that one in my head, so I'm just not even gonna try. I think the excellent takeaway from this problem is that notice we were given information about the probability of lung disease given that they're a smoker. But look what we were able to do we were able to flip, to reverse this probability statement. Thanks, Hayes. We were able to answer questions about the probability that they're a smoker given that they have lung disease. That is actually the real power of conditional probability. Based on that formula, you can literally switch these statements and figure out both directions. Given that we know that they're smokers, what's the probability they have lung disease? Given that they have lung disease, what's the probability they're a smoker? Those are not the same probability statements. They are in fact much different. You can see 0.12 is not the same as 0.45. Well, all that is 1050. It wasn't the best of our lectures, mostly my fault but I've given you two excellent resources um, to go see the examples I was dragging us through um, yourself. Sections, I'll let you look at the beginning of this lecture again, and I'll post it in my email to us at the end of today, once I post videos up.